Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about euthanasia, also called as mercy killing. I am Dr. Suresh Padanmat, Professor of Psychiatry, working at Nimans, Bangalore. Before I start my presentation, I would like to place this disclaimer. This presentation is for academic and training purpose only, not for professional legal opinion. For legal opinion, please do contact an advocate. Conflict of interest? None. In this video, I am going to discuss about euthanasia, that is mercy killing, what is the legal framework under which euthanasia has been defined across the world and also the legal framework in India. And finally, I will be discussing about the recent Supreme Court judgment with regard to euthanasia. And we will conclude how this judgment is going to bring change in our society. The target audience for this video is doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, policy makers and influencers, advocates, judicial officers, mental health professionals, patients suffering from chronic illness, human rights activists, social workers and general public at large. Let's understand what is euthanasia. Euthanasia means good death, also called as mercy killing. It can be physician assisted suicide. That means physician will enable the patient to hurry up the process of dying. Further, euthanasia is defined as a hastening of death of a patient to prevent further suffering. In simple word, painless inducement of a quick death. This is how euthanasia has been defined. However, World Health Organization has given a good definition. It is a deliberate act undertaken by one person with the intention of either painlessly putting to death or failing to prevent death from a natural cause in case of terminal illness or irreversible coma of another person. So this is comprehensive definition, but however difficult to understand by common people. Now let's enter into the euthanasia legal framework. Every country and even in every country, the states have their own legal framework with regard to euthanasia. Euthanasia is legally possible in certain countries like Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Colombia and Canada. Here it has been legalized. And similarly, physician assisted suicide is legal in six American states like Oregon, Washington, Montana, Vermont, California and Colorado. So these are the places where euthanasia has been legalized. But some countries have completely banned euthanasia and few are trying to regulate it. Euthanasia remains a heavily debated medical topic from the philosophical view, ethical view, legal view, religious and societal issues. But let's understand, whenever the legal framework comes into any issue like euthanasia, all these medical, ethical, legal, social, religious issue comes into picture. Now, if you look at the legal framework in countries where euthanasia has been legalized, what are the factors which play a role? There are six different factors. The first factor is whether the physician is assisting the suicide, that is euthanasia or not. In some country, like US, physician assisted is available. But however, in other country, the physician is not going to be there when euthanasia is administered. The patient has to administer himself. So, whether the presence or absence of physician and however, Many of the physicians know ethically they have taken oath, that is Hippocratic oath, that they will not do any harm to the patient, whomsoever it is. So, considering the, the oath taken under the Hippocratic oath, many doctors refuse to do this. Hence, they have been kept out of the ambit of euthanasia. The next comes is intentionality of the patient, whether the patient is consenting or not. If the patient is consenting, it is voluntary. If the patient is not in a position to give consent, that means he is in coma, he is in altered sensorium, he is in a terminal illness with loss of capacity. That is, and if euthanasia is given, it is called as non-voluntary. And the final was involuntary. Here the patient has said, I want to leave. And the doctors go ahead and give euthanasia. That is involuntary and many countries include where it is legalized, it is considered as homicide. So, involuntary euthanasia is not allowed. Coming to the other important, 
the way the intervention is based. In active euthanasia, the poisonous injections are given or else a intervention is done proactively. Whereas in passive euthanasia, the doctor will not do anything apart from withdrawing the support. It may be a ventilator support has been withdrawn or else the feeding may be RT feeds, what we call it as rile tube feed, which has been given to the patient is withdrawn. IV fluids are not given or else life-saving drugs are withholded. That is passive. Here, the physician is not doing any intervention. In active, it is proactive measures taken. In passive, the proactive measures which has to be taken to protect the life is not done. Hence, it is called as passive. Next comes is, who should or who is eligible for euthanasia? That is medical requirement. Is it incurable illness like mental retardation or else incurable schizophrenia? Or else it is a chronic kidney disease or else terminal illness like cancer stage 4 or else persistent vegetative state like a severe head injury, the person is almost in a coma or else is not in coma but is opening his eyes but is unable to speak, unable to walk, is unable to take care of himself. That is persistent vegetative state or else is it a brainstem death or else if the patient is in coma. And so, various requirements have been placed in various legislation. So, this requirement plays a crucial role how euthanasia is administered. And coming to how the resources have been placed in the society. For example, in some countries like Australia, this completely healthcare is based on public funding. Whereas in US, it is private funded. So, euthanasia becomes very important if it is public funded or else private funded. So, how the healthcare is distributed across the country. Imagine if euthanasia is legalized and the government doesn't give any healthcare, then it says, okay, you have illness, go and take euthanasia. We are not going to provide you any healthcare. So that means that's a very essential component. So how the funding for health is coming from. Similarly, how the constitution of the country is drafted, like how the right to life is interpreted in a country. So in that matter, the legal frame of, of euthanasia is defined across the world. Let's understand one of the important cases which has been discussed in majority of the Indian euthanasia cases. It may be Aruna Shanbagh case or else Gyani Kaur case. So in this case, this case has been discussed. So before we move into the Indian uh, case studies, let's discuss about the UK based case. In this case, which occurred in 1993, Tony Bland was a victim of Hillsborough football stadium disaster. This disaster occurred in a stadium where a landmark football match was supposed to be played. The crowd was so much that it went out of control. The police of UK were unable to control the cloud, crowd and hence there was a stampede. Imagine there was a massive casualty occurred. Almost 96 people died and unfortunately, Tony Bland sustained severe head injury and went into coma and he was in a persistent vegetative state. He was kept alive by giving supportive mechanical or artificial ventilation, hydration and feeding was done. So, hence the National Health Services approached the court and asked, can we withdraw the life support? So this was the case which finally went to the House of Lords and it was discussed, deliberated and one of the issue in United Kingdom, the doctor should not do any harm. In this landmark decision, the court clearly said that the doctor could lawfully withdraw artificial treatment from Mr. Bland. So this was the decision. In this case, they just stopped feeding the patient that is Mr. Bland. So this became a landmark decision which discussed about passive euthanasia. So this is how the discussion occurs. As I mentioned earlier, who is providing health services? Who is funding it? Imagine if the state is funding and the person is in persistent vegetative state, the family will say, provide care. I want my family member to be alive. Whether he is in coma or persistent vegetative state, that means the state will bear the expenses. On the other hand, if it is private funded healthcare, the government will say, 
you have nothing to do it is your choice then the family member have to take the shot whether euthanasia should be given or not hence funding or the finance plays a very essential role in our system especially in india and places like us the healthcare system accessibility cost quality availability plays a important role now let's move into the constitution of india how right to life has been defined we will discuss some of the fundamental rights for example right to freedom of speech that means in india every citizen has this right to freedom of speech if he does not want to speak it is his choice that means he has a right to speak but he doesn't want to speak it is his choice right to freedom of assembly i don't want to go to the assembly it is my choice right to freedom of association i don't want i don't want to join a association it is my choice although there is a right but i don't want to exercise it right to freedom of practice any profession i don't want to practice any profession so that means though, although there is a right but i don't want to exercise it similarly right to freedom of religion i don't want to practice any religion so it is my choice that means there is a positive proactive rights given by the constitution at the same time the citizen has a right to choose or not to choose similarly right to education i don't want my children to study or i don't want myself to study so the right to education i can withdraw now the question comes that means there is a positive way to look at a right but at the same time i do not want to exercise that right if you have understood this concept now let's understand in indian constitution there is article 21 right to life and liberty that means i have a right to life but at the same time if i decide right not to live why should i live my life is in a very pathetic state i am born in a poor family i don't want to be a female because females have been considered a lower gender in many of our society so i don't want to be here so i have a right to life that means right to not to live is also one of the important discussion in this discussion indian penal code 309 p ipc was discussed in many of the cases that means indian penal code 309 talks about attempt to commit suicide since indian penal code is a direct descent of uk that is lord macleay who has drafted it we have never changed it till 2017 but however lot of changes occurred with regard to attempted suicide 309 ipc clearly says that whoever attempts to commit suicide and does an act towards the commission of such offence shall be punished with simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to 1 year with or without fine that means imagine although i have a right to life and i want to die that means i do not want to exercise that right if you attempt and fail you will be punished for 1 year or with or without fine so this issue was discussed deliberated uk had repealed the attempted suicide punishment hence the indian law commission in 42nd report in 1971 recommended section 309 being harsh and this does not sustain the constitution of india that means it has to be removed the government of india accepted it in the indian penal code bill 1972 unfortunately although it was passed in rajya sabha in 1978 unfortunately it would got it could not be passed in lok sabha in 1979 and the government was dissolved hence it was kept in the cold storage but however there was an important case which came in front of high court of maharashtra that is maruti shripati dubal versus state of maharashtra in 1986 this is a very interesting case mr maruti is working as a mumbai police he has put in 19 years of services in mumbai police in one day he meets with an accident that is a road traffic accident and sustains a severe head injury and after this head injury he was hospitalized and he was in coma when he regained consciousness he had severe behavioral changes and he used to become angry he used to become behaviorally disturbed he used to have auditory hallucination that means hearing of voices he used to believe that people are trying to harm him he had delusions he was diagnosed with post head injury schizophrenia psychosis basically he was given various medication he was admitted to the hospital and on 
Here, one of the corporate, that is municipality, a one person had given him a letter so that his wife can get some kind of concession from the municipality commissioner to open a vegetable vending shop in one of the place. That, when he took that letter to the municipal commissioner, he refused to give him. And since Maruti Shripati was very impulsive because of his head injury, he tried to commit suicide in front of the municipal commissioner's office by pouring kerosene on himself. And this relay, this caused a lot of anguish and immediately was arrested. He was charged under section 309 IPC. That means attempt to commit suicide is a punishable offence. That means he has to be punished for one year and who knows he will be removed from the job also because he has committed a crime under Indian Penal Code. There was a landmark decision taken by Mumbai High Court. That is B.K. Patel and P. Savant was gave a landmark judgment with regard to this. In this judgment, they clearly said that right to life means have a right to die with dignity. And it clearly said that Section 309 IPC, Indian Penal Code, violates Article 14 and Article 21, right to life of the Constitution and must be struck down. That was the landmark decision. Further, it also said that 309 IPC, if an individual wants to die, it is his choice. Whereas, when it discussed about euthanasia, it said somebody has to intervene here. Hence, euthanasia is not standable under this. Further, it also discussed about 306 IPC, that is abatement. Abatement means a third party has to push a person to commit suicide or else he is not doing something which he is supposed to do. That means abatement has occurred. The third party is required. So euthanasia falls into this abatement of suicide. Hence, in this decision of Maruti Shripati versus State of Maharashtra in 1986, it clearly said that euthanasia is not sustainable and Section 306 IPC can be pressed for abatement of suicide. But however, attempt to suicide was decriminalized and it also gave a clear instruction. All prosecution lodged under the Section 309 IPC and pending in any court of law in the state of Maharashtra should be stopped and also stand squashed. It was a landmark judgment if you ask me. And this, this case again has been discussed in many of the celebrity cases. Now, there was another landmark judgment which came in Supreme Court of India. Let's understand how the Supreme Court of India has interpreted Article 21, Right to Life and Liberty. This is P. Ratnam versus Union of India in 1994. Here again the question was came in, validity of Section 309 IPC. That was questioned. If you understand the state of Maharashtra High Court, that means jurisdiction is only to the Maharashtra, whereas the Supreme Court means across India. So, now it is the question whether 309 IPC has to be sustained at the central level so that all the high courts and all states will get the benefit. There were two petitions, one is P. Ratinam and another case from Orissa was filed challenge the validity of 309 IPC. They are telling that 309 IPC violates the Article 14 and Article 21 of Constitution of India. The Apex Court made it very clear and it said that there should be a distinction between a person who wants to kill himself, that is suicide, versus somebody else is pushing to commit suicide, that is abatement. One comes under 306, that is abatement, and 309, who wishes to kill himself. That means a person who wants to exercise that he wants to die, right to die. The other person is pushing somebody so that he commits suicide. So there is a distinction and this distinction is sustainable both principally and conceptually as per the Supreme Court of India. Further, euthanasia was also discussed and brought under 306 IPC and said that third party intervention is required and hence euthanasia comes under this and it is not permissible at any cost. So it also said that euthanasia is not possible but however 309 IPC, a person who wants to kill himself should not be punished. Hence, Apex Court on 26th April 1994, in its, in its landmark judgment, it clearly said Section 309 IPC violates Article 21 and so forth, it is void. First time, 
in the independent India. 26th April 1994, Section 309 IPC became null and void. But this did not last longer. There was another interesting case which came in front of the Supreme Court. This is Gyani Kaur versus State of Punjab in 1996, that is within a period of two years. That means for two years, there was no punishment for Section 309 IPC, that is attempted suicide. In this case, Mrs. Gyani Kaur and Mr. Harban Singh had committed an offence. In this case, they harassed their daughter-in-law, that is Kulubant Kaur. So Kulubant Kaur committed suicide. And at that time, both lower court and the high court of Punjab punished Gyani Kaur and Harban Singh. But however, it was challenged in the Apex court. What was the challenge? They clearly said that in P. Ratinam versus Union of India, which clearly said that Section 309 IPC is unconstitutional and it violates Article 21. They also argued that means a person has a right to life and also since the Supreme Court has said, it also said right to die is a fundamental right. If somebody wants to enable right to die, that means it should not be punishable offence. That means right to life is there and after the Supreme Court judgment in 1994, if somebody wants to die and somebody is assisting them, that means they should not be punished. There should not be any penal punishment was the argument. Suddenly, the Supreme Court woke up and said, no, this is not possible. It said, right to life is in the positive direction. That means preventing life from death, not in the negative sense. Hence, they clearly said that right to life is inherently inconsistent with the right to die. And right to die cannot fall within the ambit of Article 21. That was the landmark judgment and 309 IPC was brought back. And it clearly said, 306 and 309 IPC are both punishable offence. That means it was reinstated. And the Phi judge bench, that is constitutional bench, clearly said that right to life under Article 21 of Indian Constitution does not include right to die or right to be killed. So this was the judgment and hence Section 309 IPC was brought back. The court also said that right to die with the dignity at the end of the individual's life must not be misunderstood with the right to die in an unnatural manner of death. That means right to die, if it is there, it should be a natural death, not unnatural death by an intervention of a third party or else by an abatement of a third party or else not doing something which is supposed to prevent death of that person. Apex court cautioned. That means even in case of physician suicide is sufficient to indicate that assisted suicide is outside the category of right to life and right to death and it is a punishable offence and it will be considered seriously. So constitutional validity of 306 and 309 IPC was upheld and 309 IPC came into picture again. And further, the constitution bench of the Supreme Court that is state versus of Punjab, both euthanasia and assisted suicide are not lawful in India. Court further observed that euthanasia could be made lawful only by legislation. This was one of the mistakes, the decision taken by the Supreme Court at that time. However, later in the various judgment, it has been criticized. Now, moving to the another landmark judgment, that is Aruna Ramachandra Shanabag versus Union of India. In this case, a Aruna, 25 year old lady working in a KM hospital, Mumbai, she was engaged to a doctor. On 27th April 1973, she had finished her duty. She was, had gone to change her clothes in the basement of the KM Hospital Bombay. One of the contractual employees, Shonalal Bharat Valmiki, a sweeper, went and assaulted her. He sexually assaulted her. He tried to rape her and found that she was having periods. Hence, he sodomized her. That means had an anal intercourse forcibly. To restrain her, he used a dog chain around her neck. This resulted in severe anoxic brain injury and she developed persistent vegetative state. 
That means she could not speak. She could not walk. She was completely bedridden for rest of her life. She required one person's constant assistance for feeding, for passing urine, for passing excreta. That means she is dependent on another human being. That was the state after the sexual assault. This is an unfortunate incident. But over a period of time, family abandoned her. She was looked after by the nurses of KM Hospital for past 37 years. She was sleeping in the same ward in number 4. Aruna never developed even a single bed source or fracture. This was appreciated in the apex court decision. That means she was given a due quality care which is required by the nurses of KM Hospital. Even the KM Hospital administration had to think of shifting her. But the nurses stood unanimously in solidarity, said that we will provide care to her till her last breath. And this happened. Their dedication and care was appreciated by the Supreme Court also. She is Bruna Shanbag when she was young and later when she became persistent vegetative state. And during this period, a social worker, Miss Pinky Virani of Mumbai, claiming to be a next, next friend of Aruna Shanbag, filed a petition under Article 32 for mercy killing of Aruna Shanbag. She said that Aruna Shanbag is completely dependent on other person. She cannot speak. She cannot communicate. She is almost a brain death. And why should we prolong her life? We are torturing her. So, there should be a dignity in death. We should not do this for a lady. This was the application. And the Supreme Court took it for discussion. And in the discussion, the Supreme Court was very, very clear. It clearly said, Aruna is in a persistent vegetative state. That means, she cannot walk, she cannot speak, she cannot communicate. But she is not in coma, she is not brain dead, or she is not terminally ill. She lived for next 37 years. And it also said that, under the Transplantation of Human Organ Act of 1994, she does not qualify the definition of brainstem death. Here, Aruna Shanbag was able to open her eyes. She was able to observe the environment. She was able to appreciate if any food is given to her. But however, she could not communicate. So that means she is not brain dead. Hence, the Supreme Court was very categorical. Yes, she is in a persistent vegetative state, but she is not dead. At the same time, it also, the Supreme Court questioned the locus of stand of Pinky Virani. It's asked, when the family members have abandoned her, you miss Pinky Virani, what is your locus of stand You have not even carried her for one day. How can you ask for mercy killing for whom you do not know much? Then the Supreme Court asked the KM hospital. The KM hospital in a solidarity along with the nurse filed an affidavit and they said that we are the legal guardian, we are taking care for 37 years and we do not want to kill our own nurse by mercy killing. Hence the Supreme Court rejected Euthanasia, that is mercy killing, because legally KM Hospital are the guardian and they did not want Aruna Shanbag to be given Euthanasia. What a landmark judgment! And the KM Hospital deserves the appreciation, the way they have taken care of their own nurse for such a long duration. And it also, Supreme Court clearly said, active Euthanasia is punishable under Section 302 or else 304 or 306 IPC. That means, Aruna Shanbagh case clearly said that active euthanasia we are not going to encourage and it is against the right to life. Further, it also said that passive euthanasia is permitted until the new law is drafted by the parliament. Until then, the following guideline was given by the Supreme Court of India. This is one of the landmark judgment and first time the Supreme Court of India came up with the guideline. What is the guideline? In this guideline, it clearly said that 
every high court in India under Article 226, that is 226 of the Constitution can grant an approval for withdrawal of life support. That means under Article 226, passive euthanasia is allowed. For that, application should be filed by the spouse or parents or a legal guardian or the treating doctor can file. Nobody else is allowed to file. So that means the people are, who are providing care can file the petition for euthanasia. And then, and it has to be filed in front of an high court. Immediately, the chief justice of that high court will form two judges bench. And this bench will definitely form a committee of three reputed doctors to be nominated. And three, the, three of these doctors will examine the patient. Here, those three doctors can be neurologist, one psychiatrist and one physician. These three doctors need to examine and submit the report to the High Court. And this report will be shared with the family members. And if the family members also agree for euthanasia, that is mercy killing, then the High Court will give permission for euthanasia. By chance, if the family members contest or contest euthanasia, then it will not be given, then the case will be heard further. So, the High Court should give its decision speedily at the earliest to withdraw the life support or not based on the report of the committee. And however, in this case, the Supreme Court declined because of two reasons. One is, KM Hospital being the legal guardian, they refused for euthanasia and Aruna Shambhag did not qualify for brain death, but she may be in persistent vegetative state. So, this was the landmark decision given by the Supreme Court of India. But however, what happened post Aruna's verdict? That means, after this case, there were many cases were filed. One of them was Mr. Narayan and Ms. Iravati wrote a letter to the President of India telling that we are elderly, we have finished our living our life, we do not want to suffer the misery of old age. Please give us euthanasia. But however, the President of India rejected this petition. Another important case came into picture that is Anamika Mishra's plea. In this, Anamika Mishra, a 33-year-old lady, writes a letter to the President seeking for passive euthanasia. She writes this letter because she was suffering from a rare genetic disorder called as muscular dystrophy. In this, the person goes on deteriorating and dies. It is an incurable genetic disorder. She was in a financially very bad state. The reason being is her father, Ganga Mishra, had died 15 years back because of the same genetic disorder that is muscular dystrophy. Now, she has to pay for her treatment. Not only that, somebody has to look after her constantly. So, she asked for mercy killing or else a financial assistance. The President of India and also the Government of India and State of UP provided financial assistance. They rejected the mercy killing. But however, the post-verdict of Aruna brought in various discussion. Counter affidavits were filed. These affidavits were filed by many state governments and also the central government. They challenged Aruna Shanbagh's case the verdict of Supreme Court. They said it needs to be revised. Not only that, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare was not in favour of euthanasia. They also quoted the Law Commission which submitted 241th report with regard to medical treatment of terminally ill patient that is protection of patient and medical practitioner bill 2006 and they said euthanasia is not enable under the constitution of India and we are not ready. And they also give various reasons. These are the reasons. One is, the doctors have taken Hippocratic worth. That means, we are not going to harm our patient. So, don't force our doctor to do, which they are not supposed to do. Further, the medical science is, is progressing very fast. Hence, do not allow euthanasia. And they also said, an individual may wish to die at certain point of time or because of depression. You are watching this video. In the past, maybe 4-5 years, 
you would have also had a passing thought in your mind. Better I would have died. Let me commit suicide. These are all passing moments under stressful situation. If a person has depression, also get these the ideas. Hence, they said, do not entertain euthanasia. And they also said, suffering is in the state of mind and the perception of the individual. Hence, they also said that nowadays good pain management clinics are available. That is, palliative care clinics are available. Hence, do not encourage euthanasia. Further, can a doctor define the terminality of the illness with certainty? That means, the government asked, can any doctor can certainly say that this person is terminally ill and is going to live only for 5 days, 10 days, 1 year, 2 year? Is that so certain? So that was the question. Further, what will happen if a persistent vegetative patient is asked for euthanasia? We have more than 50 to 60 lakh people who are having mental retardation or else dementia patients who are around 45 to 50 lakhs. That means there is no cure either for mental retardation or else for dementia. And they are going to be bedridden in short time. Family members will be going through a difficult burden. Should we give mercy killing to all of them? Or else imagine there is a severe head injury and he is in a persistent vegetative state. Should we encourage mercy killing? So, what will happen to the morale of the doctor administering euthanasia? So, these were the hard questions put across to the court. And also, there was another affidavit which was filed by the registered society called as Common Cause versus Union of India. In this case, they asked, right to life means they should be right to die with dignity. The person who is in severe pain should be allowed to die. He should not be allowed to suffer. And if he is from a terminal illness, there should be guideline to be made and death and dignity has to be done. So there was an affidavit asking for euthanasia. And this was the landmark judgment called as Common Cause versus Union of India. Let's discuss about this case. In this case, it was a comprehensive judgment given by the five judge constitutional bench of the Apex Court headed by the Chief Justice of India. This is a landmark judgment delivered on 9th March of 2018. What was the judgment? The judgment was very clear and clearly articulated what is the stand of euthanasia in India. It clearly said, right to die with the dignity as a fundamental right. That means the Supreme Court accepted it. But however, it also said that an adult human being having a mental capacity to take an informed decision has a right to refuse medical treatment, including withdrawal from life-saving devices. That means it said that right to die with the dignity is there, it is a fundamental right, but it also said that a person who has who is an adult and who has capacity can refuse medical treatment and also withdraw from life-saving treatment. That means any person who is suffering from terminal cancer, he can refuse treatment. Nobody can force treatment on him. That is the right. And it said that that is the right to die with dignity. Further, it also said that a person of a competent mental faculty is entitled to execute an advanced directives in accordance with the safeguards. That means a person can write a living will. This live will will be executed on the will of the patient. The right to execute an advanced directive or a medical directive is nothing but a step towards protection of the right to bodily integrity and self-determination. That means I can write a will telling that if I become persistent vegetative state or else if I develop brain death or else brainstem death, how I should be treated how I should not be treated can be written clearly. That is advanced directives, also called as medical will. Further, this living will will be legally valid document. It must be in written, signed by two witnesses and judicial magistrate, that is judicial magistrate of first class. Further, 
the supreme court was clear it said that no one is permitted to cause death of an another person including a physician by administering any lethal drug even if the objective is to relieve the patient from a pain and suffering what a landmark judgment it said that active euthanasia is not allowed further in case of a incompetent patient who is unable to give informed consent in such a scenario the best interest principle will be prevailing and that will be applied and such decision to be taken by specified competent medical experts and be implemented after providing a cooling period to enable the aggrieved person to approach the court of law so even if a person is incompetent the best interest principle should be prevailed now let's discuss about this advance directives which the supreme court of india has given in this common cause versus union of india in 2018 what did the supreme court talk about this advance directive what does it mean in this advance directive means any adult with intact mental capacity mental capacity means a person who is able to comprehend that means who is able to understand the process and may able to understand what is euthanasia he is able to weigh the risk of living or else dying that means he able to understand the risk and the third he is able to communicate voluntarily to the doctors that is capacity if the person has capacity in such a scenario he can execute an advance directive which has to be in writing and he has to state clearly in his advance directive what medical treatment should be given or it should be withdrawn if he develops mental incapacity and terminal illness and only to have the effect of this laying you should know it is only the process of death is delayed or else it is forwarded you should know in this process there may be anguish there may be a pain because if he had removed from the ventilator imagine he will suffocate he may feel anxiousness he may feel uncomfortable you should understand that for example if he has refused a treatment any kind of treatment and if he is taken to the home he may go through a misery before he dies that he needs to understand hence the mental capacity means comprehension that is able to understand able to weigh the risk and is able to communicate then only he is considered as of sound mind that means he is competent he can write advance directive and he needs to clearly indicate the terms and instruction without any ambiguity further a nominated representative can be done or else he can name a guardian who is going to take a decision in his absence that means if his mental capacity becomes completely lost this nominated representative or the legal guardian will take the decision on behalf of the patient what a beautiful discussion the reason is many a time family members or children do not want to give care to their geriatric parents they are tired they say let my father die they want the property hence the father can write somebody else as the guardian and those people will take the decision whether euthanasia should be given or not a guardian will take the decision only during the loss of capacity that means the senior citizen has a terminal illness further he has lost his capacity mental capacity is not there he is not a competent that time this advance directive will start acting if there are more than one advance directive imagine a elderly man has written three or four advance directives the last one will be considered as valid because the last one will be considered as the will of his choice further to register this advance directive two witnesses are required and in the jurisdictional judicial magistrate that is first class magistrate need to sign that and it has to be registered that is judicial magistrate of first class and he is going to keep a copy of it physical copy and a digital copy and he is going to forward it to the registry of the jurisdictional district court to keep the physical copy and also digital copy further the jmfc that is judicial magistrate of first class shall cause to inform the immediate family members that there is a living will has been written or else advance directive has been written further a copy shall be handed over to the competent officer of the local government or the municipal corporation 
municipality or panchayat telling that this person has written advance directive and this is his wish. Further, a copy shall be given to the family physician if he is available. But however, please do remember, advance directives becomes active once the person becomes completely incapacitated and further has a terminal illness. That is very essential. But however, the decision now will be taken by the nominated representative or the guardian. That means euthanasia to be given or not. But however, a person can even write the advance directive. Under no circumstances, the euthanasia should not be given. If he has written that, the state government or the person who is a legal guardian has to provide care and his will or his wish to be upheld. Now let's understand how the advance directive is taken into action. First, if a person becomes terminally ill and then he has loss of capacity, he cannot think properly and mental capacity is lost, immediately the legal guardian has to make aware the physician telling that Mr. X who is now in terminally ill and he does not have capacity has written a advance directive. Immediately once the physician gets the copy of the advance directives, physician should ascertain this person is suffering from terminal illness and lost his capacity. Hence the capacity to consent should be assessed. And immediately once the capacity is assessed and the physician comes to know he is not in a position to give consent, immediately the physician will contact the judicial magistrate first class to check whether the authenticity of the advance directive. Once he has checked, physician will immediately inform the head of the institute. At the same time, he will take the consent of the NR, that is the legal guardian, whether we can go ahead with euthanasia. Once the NR or the legal guardian has given the consent, the head of the institution will form a four-member medical board which will be set up in the treating team or the treating hospital where the patient is admitted. Head of the department or the institute will be the chief of this board. This board will consist of one person who is the chief, that is head of the department, and the three other important specialists. Those specialists can be drawn either from the neurology, psychiatry, cardiology, oncology, nephrology, and general medicine. And these people who have been chosen should have at least 20 years of experience in their field. That's a very important criteria. And these, all the three members who are chosen, will examine the patient in the presence of family members or the guardian. And they will submit the medical report which is called as preliminary opinion. And this will be in writing and will be submitted to the hospital authorities and the physician. Now, if the imagine, if the opinion is rejected for euthanasia, the process will be halted here. No, sir. If the committee gives or the board gives, yes, euthanasia can be conducted. In such a scenario, immediately the treating physician will contact the jurisdictional district commissioner or the collector with the board report, with the advance directive and the medical records. Immediately the district collector will form an another medical board consisting of four specialists. The first one being the chief district medical officer who will be the chair and the three other members who are having at least 20 years of experience either a cardiologist, neurologist, psychiatrist, general medicine, nephrology and oncology. So four members will go and examine the patient and they will submit the report either accepting euthanasia or rejecting euthanasia. The chief of the board will submit the report to the district commissioner and also to the judicial magistrate of first class. Imagine if the euthanasia is upheld, immediately the judicial magistrate of first class will visit the patient and examine him. And if he is also satisfied, euthanasia can be given. Immediately the judicial magistrate first class will authorize in writing to conduct passive euthanasia. So such a landmark judgment was given. Suppose there is a scenario, there is a conflicting reports by the two boards. That means the treating hospital says euthanasia can be given. Whereas the second medical board says should not be given. What will happen? So in such a scenario, when these two medical boards are giving a different opinion, 
the legal guardian or the family members or doctor can approach the high court under section 226 of the constitution in such a scenario immediately the chief justice of high court will for constitute a bench and that bench will again form an independent medical board of three doctors and these three doctors will be of 20 years of experience in the area of cardiology urology psychiatry general medicine Neuro nephrology and oncology and these three doctors will again do an independent examination and submit the report now please remember high court taking into consideration of the arguments and also at the same time their own independent committee's report high court shall render its decision at the earliest keeping in mind the principle of best interest of the patient and it key have to give in writing either revocation or inapplicability of euthanasia that is advanced directives so that was the decision suppose imagine there is no advanced directives written at all because as you know this decision came in 2018 how many of these doctors have written advanced directives how many of the judges have written advanced directives how should they be treated if they develop terminally illness or else if they become mentally incapacitated. Nobody has written. Hardly few would have written this. And by chance, if a person has not written advanced directive, develops terminal illness or else severe head injury and loses his mental capacity, what will happen to them? If there is no advanced directive written, there also there is a procedure clearly written under the Supreme Court verdict. Physician will ascertain the terminal illness and also at the same time will see whether the person has lost his mental capacity. That means terminal illness should be there and the person has lost his mental capacity. Immediately the, poly the physician will inform the hospital chief. A four member medical board will be formed similar to previous. That means there will be head of the department and three members who are having at least 20 years of experience either in cardiology, neurology, general medicine, psychiatrist, nephrology and oncology. Any of the three will be taken. Now this medical board will discuss with the family members of the patient or else with the guardian to discuss whether what are the positive aspect of keeping him alive and positive aspect of euthanasia at the same time negative aspect of keeping him alive and negative aspect of euthanasia. If the family members gives consent to the medical board, patient will be examined in front of the family members and a preliminary opinion will be given. If euthanasia is rejected, that means no more process. The process is halted. If euthanasia is accepted, the treating team physician will immediately inform the district commissioner. The district commissioner will form again a four-member medical board. That medical board will examine and will submit the report to the district commissioner and judicial magistrate of first class. If the euthanasia is rejected again, the process will stop. If it is accepted, the judicial magistrate first class will visit the patient and examine and he will issue the order of passive euthanasia if he is convinced. In case of conflict, in such a scenario, the either the aggrieved party, the family members or the doctor can approach high court under section 226 of the constitution of India. The High Court can form a three members committee again and they, these committee members will examine and submit a report to the High Court. Now, this is the landmark judgment which discussed about passive euthanasia in detail. Now, let's understand what are the positive aspect of this judgment and negative aspect of this judgment. This is more of academic in nature so that the people are aware what are the positive aspect of euthanasia and negative aspect of euthanasia? This is one of the best judgment which I have read, which is very comprehensive. A five judge constitutional bench of the apex court headed by the chief justice of India had given this decision. All judges were articulated their opinion in favor of passive euthanasia and clearly they were against active euthanasia. They clearly said that right to life means 
right to live with dignity and right to die with dignity up to the end of natural life that means no intervention is done no active or proactive giving of injection is done to kill him that means no active euthanasia at the same time the supreme court was clear right to autonomy was given and it was extended telling the right to self determination through giving an option to draft an advance directive for a person who is going to be suffering from terminal illness or else even if he is normal and he is adult he can draft an advance directive this advance directive is his will or his choice of the patient and that will be honored by the treating physician and this advance directive will kick off only when the person has developed terminal illness and he has loss of capacity but at the same time adequate checks and balances has been created through this supreme court judgment they have brought in two important medical boards one executive magistrate as a district commissioner and further independent judiciary further registration of advance directive through two witnesses and judicial magistrate first class who has to sign multiple copies has to be retained digital copy has to be kept procedure to start the advance directive is well documented it also clearly said that there, there should not be any ambiguity with regard to advance directives the process of appeal to the high court is also been clearly documented further if a person has not executed advance directive for them also pass with initia can be given has been clearly documented these are the positive aspects then what are the negative aspects of this judgment here the process of advance directive is lengthy already judiciary is overburden that means if each person wants to register their advance directives they need to go to meet jvmfc that is judicial magistrate of first class further involving district commissioner who is already overworked overburdened will it help that's a question to be asked further there are two medical boards has to be done each board consists of four specialist more than 20 years of experience that means eight people have to give verdict before euthanasia is carried out do we have so many specialist in the district place can we implement this in the public hospital imagine we are talking about cardiologist neurologist nephrologist psychiatrist oncologist do we have those resources are we wasting time in focusing on people who want to die we should focus on those people who want treatment who is requesting for treatment when our country has less resources should we ask our specialist to go and certify euthanasia or else appeal the right to life by treating the people who are in needy appeal is welcome but unfortunately this appeal will come with one more medical board and again discussion in the high court is it waste of time that's the question we need to ask ask are we creating a system which is difficult to access right to die in dignity having two medical board and if somebody challenges a third medical board two courts think about already there are pending cases in the court and now above this if these cases start coming definitely the case will be heard only or listed only if the after the person has died this is unfortunate in a india where is 138 crore population there will be demand for euthanasia and all the specialists will be engaged in providing euthanasia services hence advance directive should be considered or start working only when person loses his capacity and is in a terminal illness the terminal illness should be defined very clearly unfortunately it has not been defined further there is no clause how to assess mental capacity mental capacity needs to be defined and assess- assessment should be done as per mental health care act of 2017 under section 81 if the person has capacity his or wish needs to be honored irrespective of the presence or absence of advance directives and if the person has capacity his wish should be taken into consideration 
if the appropriate access to palliative care is not provided by the government or access to health care is not provided, all patients who are suffering will ask for ethanesia. What will we do? So, we need to focus on quality health care. That is the need of the hour. Investing in public health should have been the priority and should have been emphasized. Right to access for health care would have been a beneficiary for many crore people who are seeking for health care. Instead of discussing about right to die with dignity, we should have focused on right to access for health care. COVID had proved this beyond doubt. Access to health care has been very difficult for many people who are in rural areas. That means we should focus on right to life, providing access to care. That means rights-based rights health care should have been the priority and appeal the right to life. That would have been a boon to many Indian citizens. To conclude, my dear friends, our focus should be improving access to health care for all citizens. Right to access for health care should become reality in India. Right-based framework for health care should be the reality. Population of our country needs to be educated. They need to know various social welfare measures. They should not travel long distance to get the access to health care. They should get this access to health care free of cost. All essential medicine should be given free of cost. Health care should be available at the doorstep. At the remote village, it should be available. At present, available resources is not geared for euthanasia. We are unable to uphold the right to life. We are discussing about right to death with dignity. Although this judgment is a landmark judgment, which is a decades ahead of present time, this judgment should have come after 20 or 30 years down the line. Unfortunately, now it is not the time. Euthanasia law should be introduced only when the last person in the remote village has gained quality, quantity, access for health care. Then only we should discuss about euthanasia. In a landmark judgment, my dear friend, the Supreme Court has clearly said that. There is a growing recognition that the true measure of development of a nation is not in economic growth. It is human dignity. That is what we require. Right to access for health care for every citizen of India. Thank you very much for giving your valuable time. Stay safe.